like to welcome each and every one of you here today. And I'd also like to welcome our worldwide audience, whether you're watching or listening, I want to welcome you to this sixth and final presentation in this series, End Time, Love and Loyalty. And this is uh, really the most important presentation of them all. And if you haven't had an opportunity to, to connect in the previous five presentations, you have most certainly come at a point of most importance. So this is really uh, the, the most important uh, program of all as we tie all the messages together. And if you have missed out on any, I'd encourage you to try and catch up and, um, and have a way to, to connect with them. I've entitled this message, Walking with Jesus. Walking with Jesus. An incredibly important message, as I've pointed out, and that'll become very clear and obvious as we go along. I want to begin with this scripture from John chapter 17 and verse 3, where Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So here Jesus tells us in his own words, this is uh, only hours before his crucifixion. He tells us that eternal life is to be found in knowing Jesus, in having a relationship with Jesus. It's not so much knowing about Jesus or knowing a whole bunch of information. Nothing wrong with knowing things, nothing wrong with uh, knowing verses from the Bible, knowing the stories of the Bible. But unless we have an intimate relationship with Jesus, unless we know him personally, ultimately it will be to no avail. So to know Jesus, to have a relationship with him is eternal life. That is what Jesus made absolutely crystal clear. So the question that begs to be asked and we need to answer today is how can I truly know Jesus? How can I walk with Jesus every single day? And today we're going to take a look at seven different points or seven different principles, I should say, that will enable you to walk with Jesus every day, that will enable you to have that daily connection with Him that is so vital and so important. So we're going to take a look at what the Scriptures have to say because everything will be based on the Bible and the Bible alone as we have thus far. And so as always, before we open up God's Word to find out how we can walk with Jesus day by day, what do we need to do? We need to pray. So that's what we're going to do right now. So let's just pause and pray. Father in heaven, this is undoubtedly the most important message of all that we need to hear. How to walk with Jesus, how to have a daily relationship with Him. We have just read in your word where Lord, you yourself said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So today we want to discover how we can know you, how we can know you with our hearts and with our minds and how we can follow you, how we can be loving and loyal toward you. And so, Father, we ask and pray as we open your word that you will open our hearts and our minds, that we may be willing and able to receive this beautiful message from your word. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the first all important principle I want to share with you in walking with Jesus is to seek to abide in Jesus every day. Abide in Jesus every day. We have this beautiful promise that is given to us in John chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So here Jesus tells us that he is the vine, we are the branches. And there is no other way for you and I to bear fruit unless we abide in him. So how do we abide in Christ? How do we abide in him? We abide in him through his word. We spend time in his word each and every day. We pray each and every day and we share his love with those around us each and every day. Now, does this come naturally? No, it doesn't come naturally. What comes naturally is to spend time in our favorite pastimes, to spend time watching television, to spend time with our hobbies and so on and so forth. That is what comes naturally. So this does not come naturally, but it is absolutely critical, absolutely essential. If we're going to have a relationship with Jesus, we need to abide with him in his word 
and in prayer, and then we'll be able to bear much fruit as we share this experience with those around us. Notice what we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Here Jesus tells us that we will indeed be blessed if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, how do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? There was a time in my experience when I didn't find the Bible interesting. I don't know if you can relate to that. Uh, you may or may not. Maybe those who are out there may be able to relate to that. I, I talk to people all the time who share with me that, that the Bible they find is boring. Have you heard that before? It's boring. It's not interesting. Um, it, it doesn't seem to get my attention. It certainly doesn't, it doesn't arouse my interest. So, so how can the Bible become interesting? How can the Bible became, become stimulating? How can this become something that you desire, you look forward to and you long to spend time in? Well, I needed to pray because I had that problem. I had that problem of, of, of boredom when it came to reading the Bible. And even as a minister, when I first started out about 20 years ago, I didn't find the Bible interesting. I would preach and teach and share, but just to read it for my own personal um, devotions and for my own personal edification, I didn't find it interesting. So I prayed this prayer. And if you're struggling with finding the Bible stimulating and fulfilling then you need to pray this prayer. Lord, give me the desire. What was that prayer? Give me the desire. Give me the desire to want to spend time in your word. And God gave me that desire. He gave me that desire as a gift. And today I love to spend time in his word. I love to spend time with his word. And I'm very, very upset when the time comes and I have to leave my morning devotions and I need to move on to the rest of my work for that day. And it becomes a joy. It really becomes a wonderful experience. And if you ask God for that experience, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. That's the promise, isn't it? That's what we just read. If you hunger and thirst, you will be filled. So point number two, let's take a look at how to walk with Jesus. Meditate on Jesus' sacrifice every day. Notice what we find John the Baptist crying out when Jesus came to him to be baptized. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, we read these words. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus in himself, in John chapter 12, verse 32, he said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. It's extremely important that you and I, if we want to have a, a daily relationship with Jesus, we need to look to Jesus. We need to look to Jesus day in and day out. Don't get discouraged by looking at others or by looking at your circumstances or by looking at yourself. And that's how a lot of people get discouraged. But here we are told very clearly to look to Christ, to, to look to His sacrifice, spend time meditating on His incredible love, on His sacrifice. Uh, a famous, well-known, uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, she penned these words uh, many years ago, more than a century ago. It would be well, it would be well to, to spend an hour a day meditating on the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. You see, there's power when we go to Calvary. Incredible, miracle working power, life transforming, heart transforming power. When we go to Calvary and we open up to the story of Jesus and his sacrifice and his incredible love, when we, when we take a look at that that account from Gethsemane all the way to Golgotha, our hearts are touched, our hearts are moved with the love of God for us. And, and that does in us changes that, that are beyond description, changes that cannot be done in any other way. One time a thought came to my mind, I was, I was going through and I was reading, and, 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 the, and this was the thought as I was meditating and reflecting on the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John, they described the life of Christ, His ministry. And as I reflected on His life and ministry in those four Gospels, I came to the realization 
that the majority of time and space that the gospel writers dedicate to the life of Christ is focused on those last 24 hours from Gethsemane to Golgotha. Have you noticed that before? That is the place where the gospel writers spend most of their time. Jesus ministered for three and a half years. But that 24 hour period in his life, in his ministry from Gethsemane to Golgotha occupies so much time in the Gospels. Why is that? That's because God wants us to spend time meditating on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, spend time looking to Calvary. And when you spend time looking to Calvary, when you spend time looking at Christ, you look at others very differently. Because what happens is when we go to Golgotha, And when we look to Christ who is there on the cross, we recognize how sinful we are and how desperately we need Jesus and how he is our only hope, our only assurance, our only salvation. And we also treat one another with a lot more respect because we realize that the ground at the foot of the cross is level, as someone once said, and we're all equal and we all desperately desire God's grace. Thirdly, How to walk with Jesus every day? Pray for a new heart. Pray for a new heart each and every day. Notice what we read in Psalm chapter 51, verse 10. This was the prayer of David. Create in me a what kind of heart? A clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David prayed, Father, create in me a clean heart. That's what we desperately need, a clean heart. I love that word create. It gives me great hope. It means that God is able to do the impossible because I am not able to do the impossible, but God is. And that reminds me of the very first time when God created. And the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke and there was new life. God spoke this world into existence. Isn't that right? except for Adam and Eve. He spoke this world into existence. The creator of the world who created this world is able to create and recreate our hearts. Create in me a new heart. Renew a right spirit within me, writes David. This was his prayer in the context of him committing adultery and and asking God for forgiveness and asking God for a fresh new start. Will God give us this new heart? Notice what we read. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, we read, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. Out of the heart. That is our problem. Our problem is the heart. The heart. When we receive a new heart, There'll be new desires. There'll be new motives. There'll be new actions. A lot of people focus on the outward actions, but that's not our number one problem. Our number one problem is that we need a new heart. I need a new heart. We all need a new heart. When we have that new heart experience, that is when the actions, the fruit will flow accordingly. It's a little bit like lawn mowing. I don't know how many people here enjoy lawn mowing. Anyone here like lawn mowing? Yeah. Before you mow the lawn, well, I'll speak for myself. I won't speak for you. Before I mow the lawn, I have to pull out the weeds that are in the lawn. Do you sometimes get weeds in the lawn? Yeah. Okay. Unless you've got really, really good lawn. But if you've got lawn like I have, there are weeds that grow in your lawn in different places from time to time. And so before I mow the lawn, I have to pull out the weeds from the roots. Isn't that right? Or when you're weeding in the garden, you know, you don't weed with a whippersnipper, do you? Generally not. (laughs) Generally, you'll get on your hands and your knees and you'll pull out those weeds by what? By the roots. Because you and I know that unless we pull the weeds out by the roots, whether it be in the grass or whether it be in your garden, What will happen? Those weeds will do what? They will regrow. And so God knows that the only way 
we will produce fruit for His honor and glory is if we have a new heart. The old heart just won't cut it. The old heart brings forth, as we've just read, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, and so on and so forth. That comes out of the carnal, natural heart. We were born with this kind of heart. In John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You need to be born from above. You need to be born of the Holy Spirit. And so we need that new birth experience. And that new birth experience only comes from a new heart that comes to us from God as a gift. And through that new heart, we are able to put forth good works, the good works that God does in and through us through this brand new heart. Does that make sense? It absolutely uh, makes sense as far as Scripture is concerned. Now, in Ezekiel 36, 26, here God tells us what He's willing to do for us. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So God promises to give us a brand new heart. And we can thank God for that brand new heart that enables us to will and to do of His good pleasure. And so you enjoy doing the things of God because now your, your tendencies are to do God's will because you have a brand new heart rather than doing your will and what comes naturally, which is part of that stone heart experience. Let's take a look at the fourth all-important principle of how to walk with Jesus. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit every day. Notice what we read in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. This is God speaking. And you will keep my judgments and do them. So this is the same God. This is in the same passage following verse 36, where God says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll take the stone out of you and I will place my Holy Spirit within you. You see, it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to do God's will, the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, our natural tendencies are not to follow God's will, not to follow God's word. Our natural tendencies are to sit and to watch a movie for two and three hours or to watch Bathurst for five or six or seven or eight hours rather than open up God's word and spend some time in his word. Isn't that right? I don't have too many people complaining coming out of the movies after they've spent three hours watching a movie. But often people complain to me because the sermon went too long. <laughs> Isn't that true? The sermon went five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes too long. But when the football game goes into overtime, everyone's celebrating. <laughs> everyone's getting their money's worth and everyone's excited. Nobody leaves the football game when it goes into overtime, do they? No, no, no. But when the sermon goes after 12 o'clock, well, there's a problem or two or more. So we need to pray for what? We need to pray for a new heart, don't we? Because the old heart is not in harmony with God's plan and God's will for our lives, which is the best plan. So let's go to our next scripture, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where the Apostle Paul writes, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. These words, be filled, are in the continuous tense. That means that we need to daily be filled. We need to day by day seek for the Holy Spirit. We need a fresh anointing day by day. One Christian author he wrote that we are leaky vessels. We are leaky vessels. We need to be filled day by day with the Holy Spirit. Every day we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So God is willing to give us the Holy Spirit. More so than as parents, we are willing to give good gifts to our children, according to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 11. But we need to do what? We need to ask. We need to seek and we will find if we ask with all our heart, if this is something that we are seeking with all of our hearts, God will give us that wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, which is absolutely essential. There is no other replacement for the Holy Spirit. It's absolutely essential if we are to walk with Jesus every single day. Walking with Jesus. Also, requires obeying the voice of the Holy Spirit every day. 
Notice what we read in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. This is a very important passage. The Bible says we not only need to confess our sins, but we also need to forsake them. It's a two part process where the Holy Spirit convicts us that what we are doing is not in harmony with God's will for our lives. It's not part of the abundant life experience that God has for each and every person. But also God is inviting us to let go. He's inviting us to forsake those sins that are keeping us from enjoying the blessings that God so much wants to give us. I tell people when it comes to sin, sin is like cancer. Sin is like cancer. Cancer does what? It destroys people's lives. It separates loved ones. Isn't that right? It takes away from quality. It takes away from life itself. And that's what sin is. And God is inviting us to let go of that which is destroying our relationship with Him, which is destroying our relationship with one another, which is ultimately hurting us and those around us. So how important is this? It's absolutely life important. Let me share with you this story that I heard of how in India they catch monkeys. How do they catch monkeys in India? Well, what they do is they take a a clay jar Um, or a jar and they'll put some nuts or some fruits inside that jar. Now they ensure that the nuts and the fruits uh, are big enough, just big enough to fit inside the jar, but too big for the monkey to pull out that nut when he puts his hand in. So what do they do? How do they catch these elusive monkeys? In these, in these parts of India, what they'll do is they'll, 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 they'll set up their, their trap. They'll ensure that the, that the jar or the utensil is securely attached to a tree by a chain. And so they put all the, all the goodies there inside the jar and they wait. And they just wait. And the monkey soon comes along and he puts his hand into the jar and lo and behold... All his Christmases have come at once. (laughs) And he takes, and he takes the apple or he takes whatever it is in there, the nuts, a handful of them, and he tries to pull his hand out to run for his life and to enjoy these goodies. But lo and behold, you know what the story is, don't you? (laughs) He can't get his hand out. And as he sees those that are seeking to capture him coming closer and closer, he starts panicking. He starts panicking, but instead of just releasing the goodies back into the jar, taking his hand out of the jar, he holds on to those goodies. He doesn't want to let go of those goodies until he ends up monkey soup. That's how they catch monkeys. And the truth is you and I, you and I can find ourselves holding on to the goodies of this life not forsaking those goodies which are not really good. As we've discovered in our previous presentation, no good thing will God withhold from those who love Him. Only those things that are not in our best interest does God ask us to leave behind, to let go of. And so sadly, we get taken in by the enemy because we're not willing to forsake those things that are not in harmony with God's plan and God's will for us. I want to share with you the story of of Aaron Ralston. 27-year-old Aaron Rolston um, was hiking uh, in Utah, Canyonlands National Park back in uh, April of 2003. And he was hiking on his own. And as he was scampering over some boulders in this very uh, narrow part of this canyon, all of a sudden one of the boulders uh, became um, detached from where it was. And is a big boulder of about 350 kilograms or so and and it squashed his arm squashed his arm against the rock and he just couldn't maneuver his arm he just couldn't get it out he tried all he can all he could to, to try and get his arm out he just couldn't one day passed no one came 
Two days passed, no one came his way. Three days passed and he's still there with his arm pinned, the boulder pinning his arm against, against the wall. And what's he going to do? He's run out of water. Uh, it was only supposed to be a one, day, a one day hike. He's run out of food. And so he made the drastic decision. Can you believe it? He made the drastic decision, as the title suggests, there, Sydney Morning Herald, May 9, 2003, climber who amputated own arm describes ordeal. He lived to tell the story, but with a knife that he had with him, he cut his arm in order to release his body, in order to save his life. And he managed to somehow get to safety with half an arm. Here is a book that he wrote the following year, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Aaron Ralston, Between a Rock and a Hard Place. And in 2010, there was a, a movie that was made, 127 Hours, describing his ordeal. Some of you may have seen it. As I thought of Aaron Ralston and what he was willing to do in order to remain alive, I thought of the words of Jesus. Jesus said, if your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Even if your right leg or right foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, was Jesus saying that we need to do what Aaron Ralston did? Was he saying that we literally have to go pulling our eye out, cutting off our arm, cutting off our... Is that what Jesus is saying? No. What he's saying is whatever it is in your life, that is stopping you from following Jesus, that is stopping you from having that daily relationship with Jesus, whatever it is, you need to let it go. Because the truth is, if we, through the grace of God and through the power of Jesus Christ, do not let go of sin in our lives, that sin will ultimately destroy us. The Bible says Jesus came to save sinners. And sinners will only be saved if they allow Jesus Christ through his power and through his strength to deliver them from the power and the bondage of sin. We need to let go of sin. Otherwise, sin will take us down each and every time. And so I want to encourage you to be praying, Lord, what is it? What is it in my life that is stopping me from having a daily relationship with you? What is it that is getting in the way? Uh, the poison that the enemy is placing in my life that's not in harmony with your will. Lord, what is it? And help me to turn my back on sin and instead turn my eyes toward the Savior. The Bible says, flee temptation, flee unrighteousness and pursue righteousness and you will be thoroughly blessed, thoroughly blessed. God is long suffering. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should do what? Come to repentance. And you know what it means to repent? It means to change your ways. It means to, to decide to do a U-turn. It means that you're heading in one direction and you realize, no, this is not the direction that God has for me. He has a different direction for me. He wants me to walk in His ways, which are the best ways. And I have discovered that over and over again, God's ways are the best ways. Principle number six. Walking with Jesus, be willing to die to self every day. Now, this one is a very, very challenging one. Be willing to die to self every day. Notice what we read. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Denying self. When we deny self, we affirm Christ. When we deny self, we affirm Christ. What does it mean to deny self? It means that I am willing to follow Jesus in what he has for me. I like how the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. He says, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. I die daily. Now, what does it mean to die daily? It means to pray the prayer that Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Father, you know what's best for me. 
may I do your will. And that is my prayer. That is my prayer. And that is the prayer that we need day by day to be praying, Father, not what I want, but what you want. And so that is what the Apostle Paul is encouraging us to do. And did he indeed fulfill these words? Notice what we read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, where the Apostle Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life in which and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. In Isaiah chapter 14, we discover that Lucifer, who became Satan, had an eye problem. Isn't that right? He had an eye problem. Ultimately, he wanted to be just like God. And so the person who is a follower of Jesus says, no, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about your will, Father. It's about your will. Is it easy to die to self each and every day? No, it's not. Because we are going against our own selfish and very much natural inclinations. So how will that happen? Only as we receive a new heart. Only as the Holy Spirit fills us day by day. Only as we surrender our lives to Jesus day by day. Day by day. It's a day by day experience. The Apostle Paul said, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the reason is because he gave his life for me. And so I'm willing by his grace and through his strength to live my life in complete harmony with his will for my life. That was the work and that was the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And God is inviting us today, those who are living at the end of time, those who are seeking to show their love and their loyalty to Jesus Christ and to be his ambassadors, to be part of that group at the end of time that Revelation 14 verse 4 describes as here are those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. God is seeking for a people who will be wholly surrendered to Jesus, willing to do his bidding day in and day out. And we can do that through the power of Christ. And I believe we can because God promises that we are able to through his strength and through his power. And point number seven, walking with Jesus. How do we walk with Jesus? Keep your eyes only on Jesus every day. Keep your eyes only on Jesus every day. There are many that have sadly fallen away from Christ because they have placed their eyes on something else or someone else, and they've become very discouraged. Our only hope, if we want to walk with Jesus day by day, our only assurance, our only safety is to keep our eyes on Jesus each and every day. Notice these words from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. The Apostle Paul writes, Looking unto who? Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? of our faith, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to continually be looking unto Jesus. I looked up that word looking and I wanted to unpack that some more in order to understand what God's plan is for me when it comes to looking. And notice what we find. This looking unto Jesus, the word there looking means looking continually, not just occasionally. So this is continually looking at Jesus. Notice what else the word means. It means turning the eyes away from other things and fixing them on something else. <laughs> turning the eyes away from other things and turning them towards something else. And that's the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is that we come to Jesus just as we are with our sin, with our woe, with our dirty rags, we come just as we are, like the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. But God doesn't simply receive us as we are and leave us as we are, but Jesus receives us as we are, but then he transforms us into what we can become. Amen? I love the, I love the beauty of the gospel. You come as you are, but you don't stay as you are. You are transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ, by that incredible power that through his Holy Spirit, he enables people to be completely transformed. 
And as we discovered in our previous presentation, uh, the Apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, what happens when we turn our eyes off Jesus? I want to share with you the story found in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. The context is Jesus has fed the 5,000 and, and, and some. And at the end of that, he sends his disciples to cross over to the other side of the Lake of Galilee. And I want to pick it up in verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch, that's about 3 a.m. in the morning, of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you and to walk on water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But notice these words. When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sing, he cried out, saying what? Lord, save me. Peter took his eyes off Jesus. He looked at the waves. He looked at what was surrounding him. And the Bible says he began to sink. But he cried out what? Lord, save me. And notice what Matthew records took place next. Notice these words. Verse 31. And what's that word? Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I love that word immediately. The good news is when you and I take our eyes off Jesus, the sad reality is that we do take our eyes off Jesus. Isn't that right? Every time we sin, we sin because we did what? We took our eyes of Jesus. <laughs> That's the reason why we sin. Why didn't Jesus ever sin? It's because he never took his eyes off the Father. Never, not once. But the good news is when you and I take our eyes off Jesus, the moment, the what did I say? The moment we cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Lord, rescue me. Immediately, Jesus, with that nail-scarred hand, reaches down, takes hold of us and brings us back up. And the Bible says, as you continue to read the rest of the story, together, Peter and Jesus made their way into the boat. Jesus will walk with you if you allow him. And the good news is when we fall and fail, he's there just waiting, waiting for you and I to cry out to him that he may pick us up and place us back on that path, that path of righteousness that is, that is His plan and His will for our lives. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Paul writes, being confident of this very thing, that He who has what? Begun a good work in you will do what? Will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a day-by-day -day experience, one day at a time, walking with Jesus. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up when you have failed for the 1,000th time. For the 10,000th time, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Keep looking to Jesus. He has begun this good work in you and he has promised he will complete it until his precious second coming, until that day. I love this scripture in Philippians 2 verse 13 where the Apostle Paul also writes, For it is God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Notice it's not your work. It's not my work. We can't do that which is in harmony with God's will. We just can't. So what can we do? We can give our will. We can give our choice. We can give our old hearts into the hands of Jesus for him to give us a new heart, for him to place his spirit within us so that we are doing his will. And God, through his power and through his spirit, does the good work in and through us. We are just simply channels 
willing channels who have given their hearts and their lives to Jesus to be used for his good pleasure. The Apostle Paul, this is what he wrote. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have, what's that word? Finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, speaking of the second coming, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Notice this crown of righteousness is for all who have loved his appearing. It's not just for one person or two or for a select few, but it's for everyone and anyone who has loved his appearing. And notice the Apostle Paul here very clearly describes the Christian experience as a race. It's a race, an endurance race. It's not a sprint. It's, it's a day by day walk. It's a day by day march. It's a, it's a day by day journey with Jesus Christ. Step by step, day by day, you fall and he lifts you up. You fall and he lifts you up and he enables you to grow and grow and grow. And the more you look to Jesus, the, the less you fall and the more you follow him, the more you walk with him. And he does that in and through us day by day. It's just a beautiful transformation. It's a, it's a metamorphosis as the Apostle Paul refers to it, from, from, a, from a caterpillar to a butterfly. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where we are transformed in a miraculous way. Can I explain it? No. Can you experience it? Yes, indeed, yes. And that is the power of God. He wants us by His grace and through His strength to put our faith and trust in Him that he who has begun this good work will complete it. It's a race. Continue to keep the faith. Continue to fight the good fight, as the Apostle Paul says, and there will be a crown of righteousness. So how, how will this race play out in your life and my life? Uh, there's, there's no easy way to describe it. And so I want to share with you an illustration, a, a powerful uh, true story of what took place back in 1982. 1982, um, there in Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, in the United States of America, uh, the famous Hawaiian Ironman is held each and every year. This race that was initiated by 15 individuals who ran the first race in 1978, a famous race that attracts um, athletes from all around the world, considered to be one of the most grueling endurance races on the planet. The Hawaiian Ironman. Um, there, are other, there are other Ironman um, events that are held in different parts of the world. And the Hawaiian Ironman, uh, like many here that we have even in Australia, where I lived in Port Macquarie, we used to have one. It's a grueling race that involves a uh, 3.8 kilometre swim to begin with. You swim for 3.8 kilometers in the sea. Then you cycle your bike for 180 kilometers. And then for dessert, you finish off with a full marathon, 42 Ks. How would you like to do that all in a day? One activity after the other, all in a day with no breaks in between. Anyway, in 1982, uh, probably the most famous of all Ironman races took place because of a woman by the name of Julie Moss. Julie Moss. Let me tell you the story of Julie Moss. Julie Moss was a 22-year-old young lady who was studying in her final year at university and her area of study was physical education. And for her final year, she had an assignment to do, a major thesis, major assignment. Um, and so she chose as her assignment to participate in the Hawaiian Ironman the following year. This was back in 1981 when she made the decision. And in 1982 was when she prepared for that particular race. Now, she hadn't really prepared properly as you ought to for such a grueling race. She kind of did it just for fun. She wasn't very serious about 
making any impact on the race. She would have just been happy to finish and complete the race. However, Julie Moss found herself second or third after the bike leg. Into the marathon, she is second or third, somewhere there. As the marathon is continuing, she finds herself leading the race, leading the race ahead of all the other women. And she's just doing super well. Her first ever Ironman, hardly trained, didn't take it seriously. And yet she finds herself at the very front of the race. All was going well, reasonably well, up until about 10 kilometers from the finishing line when all of a sudden things started to change. She started to hit the wall. Those that have done endurance events will know what I'm talking about. She's hit the wall. But she thought, I need to press on. I need to press on. I'm nearly there. I'm nearly at the finishing line. I'll be, I'll be crowned the women's champion. I need to keep going. And so it was mind over matter. So she kept going. She kept going. Somehow, some way, she found enough energy and strength to keep pressing on. However, about a mile or 1.6 kilometers from the finishing line, she really hit the wall. She really hit the wall and she just couldn't keep going. She stopped. She looked around and she realized, I'm so close, so close. By this time, she was about six minutes ahead of the second placed female runner. She had six minutes between her and the next person and only a mile, only 1.6 kilometers to go to the finishing line. And so she kept going, she kept going. Less than a kilometer, half a mile, 800 meters from the finishing line, she collapsed. Her legs couldn't take her any longer. She just absolutely collapsed. Some people gathered around her. She felt someone's hand upon her shoulder and she knew full well, she knew full well that if she was to receive assistance, she'd be disqualified. That were the rules. And so she says, no, she waved them away. I don't want any assistance. So she got up and she tried. She tried running. It wasn't running. It didn't look like running, but somehow moving forward 200 feet Less than 100 metres from the finishing line, she collapsed again, collapsed again. They tried once again to give her some support, some assistance. No, she waved them away because she would be disqualified. And in her words, she wanted to honour the race and play by the rules. And so she got up again and she tried and this time she couldn't run. This time all she could do was walk. Try and walk, so she's walking. You can imagine. Her mind is not functioning the way it ought to. Her body is not functioning. It's not cooperating. It's like she's in a dream, but it's a very bad dream. And she's walking and walking and walking. And finally, after falling down again and again and again, she falls down 20 feet, 20 feet away from the finishing line seven meters away from the finishing line. And this time she realizes she can't get up. There's no getting up. She just cannot get up. So while she's on her hands and her knees, she crawls step by step, one after the other. And as she's crawling, she sees female legs passing her. The second place runner had caught up Kathleen and she had overtaken her and she won the race. Here is a picture. Oh, there, there is a picture of Kathleen. Sorry, a picture of Julie Moss and she's on all, all fours and she's crawling across the finishing line. She made it. She got through. She made it. Guess who received the biggest applause that day? Not, not the lady that came first, but the one who finished the race, Julie Moss. Julie Moss is an example to each and every one of us who want to walk with Jesus day by day. The best way forward is to walk, walk on our hands and knees as we follow Jesus, humbly 
seeking Him daily for His strength. And the promise is, the promise is that He who has begun a good work in you will do what? He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Finishing the race. Finishing the race. That's what it's all about. It's not about being the fastest or being first. It's about finishing the race. The Apostle Paul says, I have what? finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. It's about putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Don't look back. Don't look around you. Keep your eye focused on the prize that is before you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, my friends. Keep your eyes on Jesus. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you will never, ever be discouraged and distracted away from that eternal prize that has been set before you. What did the Apostle Paul write? That crown of righteousness, the Lord, the righteous judge, will not only give to me, but to who? But to how many? But to all who have what? Loved His appearing. All those that have continued to look to Jesus, have continued to hold on to His nail-scarred hands and have persevered under whatever circumstances have come their way and they have followed Jesus day by day by day. They have followed the Lamb wherever He goes and He has led them by His grace and through His strength in through those pearly gates into the new Jerusalem. Is that your desire? Is that your desire to be part of that group that follows Jesus Christ day by day and prepares for His soon return? And often, often that journey is on our hands and our knees. Isn't that right? Hands and knees, but moving forward. Moving forward. That's the key. Moving forward, hands and knees, looking at Jesus. Looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So as we bring this series to a conclusion, I want to invite you with the words of Jesus. They're not up there on the screen, but they are very much in my heart. We're in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and do what? And knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Today, Jesus is standing and he's knocking on the door of your heart. It matters not where you have been, what you have done. God doesn't care about what you have done, how bad you have been, or maybe how good you think you've been. <sighs> Jesus says, today I want to enter into your life. I want to give you a brand new start today. You can begin the journey with Jesus today. Today. It doesn't need to be tomorrow or next week or at another time. You can begin that journey with Jesus today. The Bible says over and over again, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Those scriptures are found in the book of Hebrews. We also read, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. So today, my friends, those who are here, those who are watching, wherever you may be or listening, I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus. Look to him. He will be the author and finisher of your faith. He has promised that this good work that He has begun in you, He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, until His glorious second coming. So I want to encourage you to keep looking to Jesus. Don't look to others. Don't look to yourself. But look to Jesus and Him alone. And He will see you through to the very end. And you will know that you have been in the presence of Jesus. When you see Him one day, one day in all His glory, and you will be with Him forevermore. I want to conclude with this beautiful appeal, the final appeal that we have in Scripture in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 17. This is the final appeal that God gives, the last book of the Bible, the last chapter in the Bible. And we read these words in Revelation 22 verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say what? Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, Come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely, freely. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit through the bride, through 
through the church. The bride is the church, the people of God, not a building, not an institution, but people who are committed and connected with Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit today is saying, come, come, come three times. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they all say, come, come, come. Receive the water of life freely. Is there a cost? Not a human cost, but yes, there is a cost. The cost is that you and I are willing to give our hearts to Jesus. We are willing to surrender our hearts to Him. That is what He requires. Nothing more and nothing less. Jesus says, give me your heart. Give me your old heart and I will place within you a new heart, a new heart that is willing and able to do my will in your life. Is that your desire? Is it your desire to receive the invitation of the Holy Spirit to come? Come, come, come. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what Jesus said. If that's your desire, my friend, I want to pray with you. Wherever you are, here, or wherever you may be, I want to pray that you will experience that daily walk with Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that through his power and through his strength, he has given us uh, the ingredients, the beautiful instructions from his word of how we can walk with him day by day. Oh, Father, we ask and pray that you will place within us the heart of Jesus, that you will place within us the Holy Spirit day by day, that through his power and through his strength and by looking unto Jesus only, who is the author and finisher of our faith, that we may walk with him until that great and awesome day when we see him face to face. This is our prayer for us, for our family, for all those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen. 